Are we looking at a new era of cooperation? Well, the Chinese president addresses the Asian-African summit in Jakarta. We'll have comments on exactly what he said and what it means for relations moving forward between Asian countries and African counterparts. This is Global Business Africa from the Kenyan capital. Welcome. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. Reeling from a $140 million half-year loss, what are the options for KQ's return? And to ban or not to ban, Uganda's battling with the cost of plastic packaging and the authorities are considering pulling a Rwanda. Let's start with the opening of the Asian-African summit in Jakarta. The Chinese President Xi Jinping has delivered a speech there with the aim of carrying forward the Bandung spirit and to promote the common development of economies on these two vibrant continents. Here's what he had to say a little earlier. President Joko Widodo, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends, first of all, I wish to express my heartfelt thanks to President Joko Widodo and the Indonesian government and to convey the sincere greetings and best wishes of the Chinese people. Sixty years ago, Leaders from 29 newly independent countries in Asia and Africa attended the Bandung Conference, giving birth to the Bandung spirit of solidarity, friendship and cooperation. The conference galvanized a movement of national liberation that swept across Asia, Africa and Latin America, accelerating the historic global process of decolonization. Based on the five principles of peaceful coexistence, the conference put forward ten principles for the handling of state-to-state -state relations. Those principles have played a significant and historical role in steering international relations in the right direction. Sixty years later, under the new circumstances, the Bandung spirit maintains a strong vitality. We must carry forward the Bandung spirit by enriching it with new elements that are consistent with these changing times. We must push forward a new model of international relations based on win-win cooperation by promoting a more just and equitable international order and international systems and by building a community of common destiny. By doing so, we can bring great benefits to the people of Asia, Africa and other parts of the world. With these aims in mind, I wish to make these following proposals. First of all, we call for greater cooperation between Asia and Africa. Asian and African countries face new opportunities and new challenges. We must stand together in good times and bad and help one another in times of crises. We must seize opportunities and face challenges together, taking our cooperation to a higher level so that we will always stay good friends, good partners and good brothers. By working closely together, Asian and African countries will gain far more than the mere sum of their combined strength. We must follow a win-win approach and align our development strategies. We need to advance the liberalization of trade and investment and promote a new architecture of wide-ranging, multi-level and all-encompassing Asian-African cooperation. We should seek common ground while preserving our differences. We must be more open and inclusive, drawing on each other's strength. Through this, 
we may see all civilizations progress and thrive together. Secondly, we must expand South-South cooperation. Most developing countries pursue a common mission to accelerate their development and improve living standards. So we should collaborate and help each other in times of difficulty. Strong cooperation between Asian and African countries can set the standard within the overall picture of South-South cooperation. Asian and African countries must build and strengthen cooperation with Latin America, the South Pacific and other developing countries and regions. We can share our experiences of governance and economics, and we can discuss important international and regional issues in order to maintain world peace and promote common growth. If we are to realize the full potential of South-South cooperation, we need to strengthen our institutions and mechanisms. China supports Indonesia's initiative to establish an Asia-Africa center. Third, we must promote South-North cooperation. The principles of mutual respect and equal treatment are the political foundations for South-North cooperation. Nations across the world, regardless of size, strength and wealth, are all equal members of the international community. They all have an equal right to engage and participate in regional and international affairs. Developed nations have an obligation and responsibility to help developing countries in their path towards development, thus narrowing down the South-North gap. It is important to encourage developed countries to fulfill their official commitments. Developed countries should enhance their support for developing countries without any political strings being attached. We should establish a new global development partnership that is more equal and balanced. We should safeguard and develop an open world economy and promote the establishment of a global economic and financial system that is fair, just, inclusive and well regulated. We should create a healthy international environment that allows and encourages developing nations to advance. Ladies and gentlemen and dear friends, China remains firmly committed to closer cooperation between Asia and Africa under today's new circumstances. By the end of this year, China will extend zero tariff treatment to 97 percent of imported products from the least developed countries with whom we have diplomatic ties. China will continue to offer assistance to developing countries with no political conditions. China is willing to join hands with all involved parties to implement the One Belt, One Road initiatives to set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and to give full play to the role of the Silk Road Fund. China will continue to push forward South-South cooperation and South-North cooperation. We will work together with other countries to safeguard peace and stability in the region and across the world and to promote common prosperity. I'd like to announce here that over the next five years, China will provide 100,000 training opportunities for candidates from developing nations in Asia and Africa. We will host the Asia-Africa Youth Festival, inviting a total of 2,000 young people from other Asian and African nations to China. We will establish a China-Asia-Africa Cooperation Center to further promote communication and cooperation between Asian and African nations. We will launch an exchange and research program on international law jointly run by China and Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. And we will host an international seminar this year under the theme of carrying forward the Bandung spirit. Your active participation in these events will be appreciated. Thank you. Now let's come back to Africa with half year losses of over $140 million. It's no secret that one of Africa's biggest airlines, Kenya Airways, is in deep financial trouble. On the 17th of April, I spoke to the airline's chief executive and he outlined three steps to recovery 
first sell off at least five aircraft and downsize the overall fleet that the airline has. Second, restructure the airline's debt, and that includes almost a billion dollars worth of long-term debt by September 2014. And finally, seek bridge financing. The thing is, though, he didn't say exactly how much the airline needs and whether that will be structured as debt or equity. Now, on the 9th of April, George Bodo, an investment analyst, wrote an opinion piece in one of the Kenyan dailies, Business Daily, that attracted a combination of thoughtful comment and angry, livid responses in equal measure. The basic outline of his argument is that Kenya Airways needs to not own any aircraft and should instead be leasing all its assets anyway. He's with me in studio right now to talk a little more about that particular article and, of course, Kenya Airways as a whole. Um, George, lots of angry responses to your article on the 9th of April. Key among them that, in your analysis, you didn't have a clear understanding of how KQ's fleet is owned and managed and that you made an argument linking depreciation, essentially, to the airline's cash flow problems. How do you respond to your critics? Uh, actually, um, thanks, Rama. I didn't link depreciation to um, cash flow position. I actually linked depreciation to uh, the bottom line, which is a PAT. Because essentially what I was saying is that um, the fact that you have all those aircraft on your balance sheet, then you need to depreciate, depreciate them on an annual basis. Um, the method is in-house. They, they agree whether it's a straight line or whichever method they agree. But I think what I was trying to say is that when you put all those aircrafts on your balance sheet, essentially you have to also depreciate them. And the depreciation figure was quite significant in the last financial year. I'm talking about 5 billion Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. Do you also stand by your comparison link, essentially? Because at some point in the article, I believe you essentially argued that, look, Uber is a fairly strong company, billion dollar plus valuation, and it doesn't own any assets. Do you still stand by that comparison? Yes, absolutely. Um, what, I, what I essentially was saying is that, um, look, Fleet ownership and fl uh, uh, aircraft management costs are quite significant. Um, and um, why can't you just put some of these things off balance sheet, you know, some of these aircrafts? Um, and instead of having finance lease, just have operational lease. So with the view of not owning the aircraft, so you're just using the aircraft on a lease basis until it wears down. It's much more cost effective. Um, it, it limits um, any potential impact on the balance sheet, especially mm. when you're doing the, the movements in depreciation figures Indeed. Um, and amortization. So uh, that's essentially what, that's what I was saying. And I have still stand to that, and I, I want to say that KQ actually should look into owning part of the fleet, but not all of it. Mm. Some of it needs to be leased out. In, in, in a transaction, what I was calling a sell lease back, because some of these things they are owning them. Some of the fleet are non leveraged. Um, the fairly, you got about 11 aircraft, the, the, seven, the 737 800, 737 700, and 300s. These aircrafts can actually be leased out. They're very expensive to maintain. They consume a lot of fuel, and maintaining them is, is so expensive, and the aircraft can actually sell them off because they're still not leveraged. Uh -huh. The Dreamliners might be leveraged at the moment and these other ones may not be leveraged. Right, we'll get back to that in a little bit, but let's start with what the management is doing right now. The carrier is going to be selling about uh, its entire stock of 777-200s and a 767 as well, although that entire fleet has been grounded, plus some land as well. In your view, how much cash will this raise and how much breathing room, by extension, does this give Kenya Airways? Uh, my view is that they will raise probably something between three and four hundred million million if they sell all these, um, this asset sale program they're having. That will not be sufficient to, um, that would be sufficient for now on the medium term basis to, you know, give some cash flow, uh, bring some cash flow uh, room uh, for the airline. But in the long term, they've got hard to, to, to repair the balance sheet. And the debt pile is quite big. The airline is heavily geared. I'm talking about gearing ratio in excess of 150%. Even if they were to do new borrowing right now, fresh borrowing, it will not be finely priced because the airline is already too leveraged and it's too risky. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's asset sell, asset sell, gradual asset sell, uh, especially on the fixed asset they're having, the land and the property that they really don't need. And, and the second thing is also to sell and lease back some of these aircrafts. And my view is that um, if they do this, it could be a 12-month program. If they do it, then they can be able to get some breathing space. Because if you look at, over the last 10 years, if you look at the, the short-term, um, the repayments of long-term borrowings, the actual repayments out of the cash flow book, it's, it's grown by over 100%. Mm -hmm. This is what is killing them. And it actually spiked over the last three years. If Indeed. you have excess of, if you have, you're doing about 20 billion in short term, sorry, long term repayment, this is quite some different cash flow. So One last question for you, George. Um, Kenya Airways Management, Kenya Airways Board, these are the exact same set of guys who got the airline 
into this mess in the first place. So is it reasonable for you as an analyst to expect that they can also be the same individuals who would take the rational decision to dig the airline out of this hole? Yeah, I've seen the new, uh, the new CEO um, coming up, the downsizing program, but essentially the board is still the same. Uh, maybe um, uh, the advent of the new CEO who just joined in three years ago. But if I analyze the previous CEO's tenure, the debt pile spiked. I think he was pro-debt, too much of it. And I think what they're seeing, the new guy, he's trying to convince uh, the stakeholders and invest investors and shareholders that, look, we want to rationalize a downside this airline. Mm. Uh, right. how much, as to how much a uh, goal he will achieve on this, I'm not sure because there are too many stakeholders in this. Um, in this. I think what he's trying to lo look for is a short-term uh, breathing space from a cash flow perspective. Uh, but I think in the long term, they still have so many debt that they need to, you know, repair. All right. We'll have to leave it there for the time being. Thank you for your time this evening. We're speaking to George Bodil on investment analyst, of course, about the ongoing cash flow problems that Kenya Airways does face. Let's head over to South Africa now. The struggling power utility ESCOM expects two of its long-delayed coal-fired power plants, the enormous facilities at Medupi and Kasilia, to be fully operational by 2021. The head of Group Capital, Abram Masango, told, said rather that Medupi and Kusile should add a combined 9 gigawatts of generation capacity to South Africa's currently strained grid. In the meantime, the utility has assured Parliament it's not on the verge of bankruptcy. ESCOM says it will cooperate with international ratings agencies to avoid further downgrades. At the moment, it faces a serious liquidity crunch. It has been struggling to power South Africa and as a result has been forced to implement regular power outages to prevent the grid from collapsing altogether. The utility's funding gap through to 2018 is estimated at about 200 billion rand. It's getting a $2 billion cash injection from the government sometime this year. Now, in the wake of the Garissa University College attack in which over 140 people died, the United Kingdom's government toughened its warning to citizens travelling to Kenya. The advisory essentially instructs tourists to avoid most coastal resorts, including the main airport in Mombasa. This is, of course, yet another blow to the country's tourism industry. Our London correspondent, Katie Gregory, sat down with Ajoa Anyamadu, research associate at Chatham House, to find out how these advisories will affect East Africa's biggest economy. Why are we seeing this UK travel advisory for Kenya now? You know, what sort of factors are at play here? Well, if you talk to representatives of the UK government, they will tell you that it's simply a reflection of the current security situation in the country, in Kenya. Um, the intelligence that they receive uh, changes all the time and they uh, adapt their travel advisories according to that. Um, however, if you hear um, the information coming from the Kenyan government, I think for them it seems to be more um, that they see these travel advisories as being really economically damaging to the country. Yeah, exactly. And obviously quite a lot of Kenya is outside of these areas that are in the travel warning. But what sort of impact is that having on sort of foreign relations and investment? Um, the Kenyan government has been quite strident in um, calling for its international friends, they do refer to them as friends, but to um, adapt their travel advisories because of the uh, impact it has mainly on the tourism sector. So how are investors actually reacting to this news, obviously, with the upgrade and travel warning? What's interesting about Kenya is that um, many foreign investors are about the country. It's um, set to grow by about 5% this year. Um, it's still seen as the biggest East Africa, you know, the uh, international headquarters, um, sorry, no, the African headquarters of many international companies are based in Kenya. Um, so um, on outside of the tourism sector, um, economically, Kenya is looking very strong. So it doesn't seem to be having too much of an impact there? Um, the impact on the tourism sector shouldn't be underplayed, though, of course. Um, it contributes to about just over 10% of Kenya's GDP. Um, and the number of uh, jobs that are being lost along the coast because of these travel advisories is quite significant. And obviously it's not just the UK as well. Australia has also upped their warnings for the area. Does this mean that the government, the Kenyan government, is going to have to step up and actually do a bit more? I think the real pressure on the Kenyan government actually outside of these travel advisories is coming from the Kenyan population. There's a very vocal uh, majority calling for better security, better investigations into atrocities that have happened recently, including the attack on Garissa University just last month. Um, for the Kenyan government, I think the international um, arena is important because of the reputation of the government. Um, it's, it still plays a really solid part in the battle against terrorism within Africa. And I think the Kenyan government wants its international partners to really recognize the difficulty that they have in um, lowering the insecurity. 
Is there a real threat there? I mean, we hear about countries, you know, lifting their travel warnings all the time and, and ramping them up. Do you think there's a real threat there for tourists? It's difficult to say. I think the threat changes, um, and this is reflected in the changes to the travel advisory that we see over time. And um, there have been attacks on the Kenyan coast um, over the the past two years, those attacks have really ramped up. So overall, um, in terms of the economy, are we going to see this have a long-term impact? Are we going to see this keep affecting the economy? I think there's always going to be an impact on the tourism sector in Kenya um, from insecurity. And we've seen this repeatedly in the past after there was election violence um, in the 2007-2008 elections. Um, and then again after the attack on the Westgate shopping centre, um, tourism also fell then. But Kenya's tourism industry is really strong and robust and outside of the beaches along the coast it's got a very strong safari industry for example which remains quite um, strong so I think the tourism industry will bounce back um, but there be, needs to be a real focus on uh, the security sector and improvements there. Right then a quick run through equity markets here for you. Uh, fairly interesting day much in reverse to what we saw a little earlier uh, in training on Tuesday. The JSC All Africa Share Index uh, the only posting the only uh, positive numbers on the board so far today. On contrast, however, in the Kenyan market, Britain is taking an absolute beating, partly because of a repricing and a reassessment of, from an investor's perspective, the value that that company offers. But there have also been quite a few interesting developments around management and governance concerns as well. Authorities at the Dweller port in Cameroon are selling off loaded containers to ease congestion. And to ban or not to ban, Uganda's grappling with the cost of plastic packaging. They're considering going down the same route as Rwanda. Africa is on the move. It's only seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies. We help you make sense of the fast-changing African business landscape. We take you where the business is happening. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. Welcome back. Now, if you're in the market for bargain on a large scale, and I mean that in a literal sense, the port of Douala in Cameroon is where you need to go. Customs officials over there auctioning off thousands of shipping containers that importers have simply abandoned. These unclaimed containers have been cluttering up the port, occupying valuable space and hampering expansion plans. This is every bargain hunter's dream. Thousands of unclaimed shipping containers filled with goods from across the world. But it's also every importer's nightmare. These containers have been blocking off large sections of the port, causing operations to grind to a halt. It's a question of a sale transaction. Containers that have stayed here for more than 90 days will be auctioned off. So started a most unusual auction, as many buyers don't know what's inside the container until it's opened. The operation is very good, but every buyer must beware because the contents of the containers may be the wrong merchandise. Add to that auctioneers had to sell the containers in a regular structured order rather than piecemeal. You know, when you file the container, it must be removed. And if it's not removed, then there is no way to file for another. This is what causes the disorder. Despite the problems, 50 containers of the 4,000 were sold in just the first day. The auction will continue until all the containers have new owners. Valdi Karlsa, CCTV. Now, supermarket chains in Uganda have started phasing out the use of plastic bags from their outlets. On the 15th of April, the state-run environmental body instituted a ban on the manufacture and use of the synthetic material, citing environmental concerns. However, plastic manufacturers blocked the ban and then the government lifted it. The $9 million plastic recycling industry employs over 6,000 people in Uganda. And as Michael Beleke reports, this is not the first time Uganda has tried to ban plastic bags littered almost everywhere. Plastic bags are a highly visible ugly component of waste material. 
According to experts, the bugs do not readily decompose and release toxic chemicals in the natural environment. It does not degrade uh, so easily. So when it goes into the soil, it just chokes the soil and it remains there for years and years. And this is why the state-run environment body believes the manufacture and use of plastic bags should stop. And the locals are in support of the move. All those manufacturing and anyone found holding or using the plastic bag should be arrested for destroying the environment. We have grown up using plastic bags, but they have caused more harm than good. Some large retail shops in the capital Kampala have completely phased out the bags. Shoppers now have to come with a curry bag for their groceries or buy an alternative paper bag or box at a fee. Kampala city authorities spend thousands of dollars every year cleaning up this water channel, often clogged by plastic bags. Sometimes the bags are mistaken for food by animals, leading to their death. But hours after introducing the ban, the government suspended the move, citing displeasure from manufacturers. Environmentalists say the decision by government undermines the power of the environment body and are now threatening both court and industrial action. So we are going to mobilize the masses and we go and demonstrate and, and show our uh, dissatisfaction. Plastic manufacturers have long influenced government's decision, arguing that they have invested heavily in recycling plants. They also say if the ban is maintained, thousands of workers will lose their jobs. It means we are not able to turn around the materials that we have brought in. These are materials that come on credit, we have to pay back people's money. We are not able to, to do that. We have obligations in banks. We shall not be able to meet as they fall. In 2009, Parliament banned the importation, manufacture and use of plastic bags, but the environment body was again blocked when it tried to implement the ban. Michael Baleke, CCTV, Kampal. All right, then a quick run through commodities before we wrap up the program. Uh, 6259, the relevant number on Brent crude. Some forward looking data here if you're heavy on uh, exposure to Ghanaian oil. On Saturday, April 25th, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea will be ruling on a maritime dispute between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire, of course, has uh, applied for a moratorium on all development activity in the area that's in dispute. And that, of course, will have a ripple effect, especially for Tullow Oil, because the other ones are developing the 10 projects on that side of the world. We'll keep tabs on that story for you right here in Global Business. But that's it for this edition on the program. We like hearing what you think about what we do around here. Global Business Africa at cctv.com is the email address to use. And of course, when we're not on air, Facebook and Twitter are your ports of call. Thank you for watching. See you in 23 hours. I'm Ramanyan.